Fountainhead Forum 6. I'm talking with Canadian anarchist uh, filmmaker Chris Harrigan. Uh, he's located in New Brunswick, and he has some interesting things to say about the recent protests about protests on, about the coronavirus situation in Canada, Justin Trudeau, and Canadian politics in general, and of course, uh, his career in media, uh, because he's had a long career in media, and it's certainly been interesting to watch. How are you today, Chris? I'm doing fine. How are you, Chris? I'm doing all right. Uh, first of all, uh, how did you uh, how did you get into filmmaking, and how did you become an anarchist? Well, that's uh, okay. So I was a high school dropout. <laughs> yeah. And um, at one point, I decided that wasn't how it was going to go down. And I went to college and got my, uh, my credits and I went to university. And um, I was taking philosophy. And uh, I, ran, I had this professor I really, really liked. And he introduced this whole idea of anarchy because I was looking for a way to think, you know, like uh, everything makes sense when you're young. Communism makes sense. Capitalism makes sense. Everything. But then I ran into anarchy and it was like perfect, like the golden rule. And he got us to make a video about freedom. And I just I was hooked. Uh, he wrote me a letter. I, I dropped out of university. I took I went to film school and. The rest is history. Like that was twenty five years ago. You know. Yeah. What What university was that? What film school was that? Well, it wasn't a big university. It was University of Moncton. <laughs> okay. And uh, the film school was just uh, New Brunswick Community College. Like, okay, and and yeah. Moncton is the largest city in New Brunswick, I believe. Correct. Which isn't saying much because there's really yeah. just like two little main streets here. It's it's yeah. not a very big population. Yeah, and and Fredericton is the is the is the capital. What's what's the population of New Brunswick about for people who may not know? At like half a million, I think. Okay, yeah. Don't quote me, but I think you know. <clears throat> okay, just for clear clear that up. So, so anyway, so then you then you got into filmmaking and you introduced you to philosophy. Was there any anybody that really stood out for you in uh, philosophy or po politics or any any one guru? You had a lot of gurus. George Carlin and Jello Biafra. And really, George Carlin was a big one. Like, that really opened my eyes, that guy. Angelo Biafra is who I have not heard that name at all. I certainly know who George Carlin, and I definitely think George would have been a – George was a great libertarian or a great anarchist, definitely. Angelo Biafra was the lead singer for um, uh, the Dead Kennedys, which was a band. But he did, he did this spoken word stuff, and it was oh, yeah. And that's what I actually put in the, the front of my film was a spoken word that he had done. And yeah, so it's my everything was just opening up for me at that point. Philosophy was a really good thing. I was really yeah. disappointed with university because I was taking psychology. Yes. Are, but, are the, yeah. Are but the philosophy colleges, really, really opened my mind. Yeah. Are the colleges in Canada as bad as the colleges in America as far as? Yeah. You know, lots of socialist professors and lots of, uh, you know, professors just singing the praises of Karl Marx. And yeah, I was only, you know, like I, I was, I think I quit in my third year and, and went to film school. Okay. Um, so you went to film school. Yeah. It sucked. Like, I, I'm so I can't really like give a really profound answer to that, but I know I was disappointed. I was just repeating what I was being told and, being told to read and uh and i and i was a counselor and stuff for um I, like i worked in the the industry i was a counselor for schizophrenics and mental illness and like i, I walked the walk you know and and kids like i worked at the boys and girls club but there was nothing it wasn't like i you had the prestige of saying i'm going to university and you know like but i wasn't really learning anything like really yeah you know. Have you pretty much stayed in New Brunswick since then, or been to other parts of Canada? Been trapped, lived in other parts of Canada, or? Well, after no, I, I was in Halifax for quite a while. Halifax is the bigger okay. city in Eastern Canada, like, so it's like Toronto. It's like Eastern Canada's Toronto, I guess. Or yeah, it's, not, it's yeah, it's a it's I believe it's the capital of Nova, Nova Scotia as well as the largest city, right? Yeah, it's it's quite big, and uh, that's where most of the like the film industry was. Oh, okay. Uh, 
So that's that's why I was there for. It's not. I don't think it's quite as big as Toronto. So there, so there is some. There is some. Uh, there is some film, film and TV and stuff going on in Halifax. I did not. I did not realize that. Yeah, but they cut the uh, tax credit here in New Brunswick, yes. which essentially destroyed the industry. And then I, I was working for the Trailer Park Boys in Halifax, which is a, a big show here in Canada. And um, then they cut the tax credit there. So it essentially like wiped out the industry. It's coming back slow. It came back slowly, but we were all out of work for a couple of years because of that. Yeah. Is yeah. the is the industry heavily subsidized in Canada? It sounds like it is. Yeah, it, it depends on the tax credit. That's how the producers make the money. Like, okay, uh, so they so they give them so they say well so the producers uh, they end up paying less taxes so they just get a, a, a tax credit. You said, yeah. and that's their pay essentially that's their pay okay yeah i think they're trying to i think they're trying to do something like that in america but of course also canada has the uh has as the content laws uh, as far as you know the bbc uh, and stuff like that yeah yes i mean you know you know it's interesting i i i I like to joke that americans love canadian game show hosts because we have alex trebek we've had monty hall and we've had jim perry and and those canadians could come down here and host a game show in america but if an American tried to go to Canada and host a game show, that American would have to have a Canadian co-host. In Canada, it yeah. pretty much the the entire industry relies on yes. the government. Yes. So there there is your censorship. This is why I left the industry in in 2018 because I couldn't tell the stories I wanted to tell. It was a hard road. I wasn't making the big money anymore, but that's what led me to where we are today and that's uh uh like on the 29th, I'm releasing Tiptoe to Tyranny, which is my newest film. And these were interviews I took uh, in Acapulco in 2018 that were very prophetic. Like they, they just, des- they, they describe what we just went through back in 2018, like through, so through COVID, I mean, like, yes. you see what I mean? Like th- these people already knew uh, I got uh, interviews with, uh, Max Egan, G. Edward Griffin, Jeff Berwick, Luke Radowski, like a lot of the, you know, the alternative um, minds and people that you hear of yes. today. And, and as I was actually um, covering all the things that were happening with COVID, like it just, it was all marrying up. It was like, oh my God, like these guys were saying this way back in 2018. And that's how this film series that I'm now releasing came to be you know it's because of that that should be very interesting uh i, I certainly look forward to seeing that uh, uh you know uh, for to, just to clarify for anybody watching luke rudkowski is the is the is the head man with uh, i believe he's the head man with we are change uh yeah. I, I don't know what his title is but it, it, you know we are change is his his site and max egan is a uh, is a very interesting uh australian uh conspiracy theorist uh and you know, some conspiracies, I think, are theories are, are baloney, but some some make sense. They just you yeah, just have to wade through the ones that make sense. And, you know, the world's run right on conspiracies. Yeah. Like that's the, the, the oh, yeah. bus- you know, business. Yes. Is, yes. You, you and I, <laughs> yeah, you and I, yeah you, you and I made an agreement to do this video and that was an agreement. I mean, we we didn't really tell anybody about it. Now we're going to share it later. But yeah, you know, that, that that's also I mean, people make agreements to do to work on things and you know, I, and, you know, I always say, you know, you look at, you know, you know, if you, if you don't, people who don't believe in conspiracies, you know, look at all the, the, the various, you know, all the times that, you know, people, for example, have thrown games in sports or something like that, you know, or, yeah. or, 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 or studio wrestling. Uh, it's a bit too much of a blanket term now, right? Yeah. Like, you know, you just throw that <laughs> word on it or the term like conspiracy theory, and then, oh, it has no value. But, well, I mean, it's you- it's used as a term of derision by some people who just want to dismiss and say, well, that's just a conspiracy theory. And, and some, and some, or and some, and granted some, I think are rather crazy. I, uh, the people who, the people who say the moon landing was fake. uh, I think that's, I I think that's a little bit out there, but you know, those are, and you have to be careful because I think if you embrace some of the silly ones, you, 
you're less likely to get embraced on the good ones. Yes, I I met you. But from a producer's point of view, if I was going to go to the moon, I would have plan B over here happening also because Mm -hmm. it was too big to fail. So you got to think like that too, right? You know, like there are some, there are some uh, like weird things with the, like I know as a, as a photographer, I like 90 degree angles on, you know, a certain like two rocks, like that can't really happen unless the source of light is quite close. Mm -hmm. And what I'm I'm just suggesting, I, I don't know whether they went or not, it doesn't matter to me, but like you have to think about that side of things. Like if you're if you're gonna do something like that, you can't have it fail either. So you yeah. know what I mean? Like, so why not do both? Yeah. And yeah, then where, you can never really know yes. the truth. <laughs> where did you uh, where did you work in where did you work in media? Uh where where have you worked in media? It sounds like you've worked for some established organizations in media. In, Oh, established. I've worked for CBC, Discovery Channel, History Channel. Um, like, th- it'd be harder to Fox, ABC. Like, it'd be harder HBO just now because of the anarchists. I was a cameraman on that. Yes, yeah, yeah. You, you yeah, you worked on the anarchists. Uh, CBC, of course, being the the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, so. brainwashing corporation. Yeah, <laughs> which, which is owned by the Canadian government, as far as I, I know. Uh, it is like yeah. it is directly yeah. owned by the Canadian government. And then, like before COVID, like Justin Trudeau paid a, like a ridiculous amount of money to all of the media's, including CBC, to to say what he wanted essentially, and that's that's a fact. That I'm not making that up. But, it's like it was like 1.6 billion dollars he paid. Yes, you know. Uh, now, yeah, let's let's get down to that. Uh, what what can you tell? What let's start from the you know the late 2019, early 2020. Uh, what were you seeing happening with regard to the the coronavirus narrative or the COVID narrative and all that stuff? Okay, well, for for myself, when the very first day of Corona, I didn't buy any of it. And the reason why is because I was the guy with the camera and the teleprompter. Yeah. What, when, what every was network, when every network in the world is saying the same narrative, but not only the same narrative, but the same words. Yes. Something's up. You know, so, like I knew that right away. Like television you, is lost on me. Like, What was the first day of COVID? I mean, can you point out a calendar when that was? N- no, but wasn't it in... Um, February or was it March? It was March, wasn't it? Well, like, I, mean, I just remember my my son. I was talking to my son's mother. Well, uh, and she yeah, was like, yeah. "Well, he's not at school today because of this pandemic." Okay, right? And I don't watch television, which is ironic. Okay, well, I I'm just asking because different. You know, there were different different things happened on different days. I mean, well, yeah, it was the day they know, well the kids couldn't. Well, go in America, anymore. you know, there was you know in America there was Trump. There was you know first there was Trump shutting down flights to China. And then there was, uh, I mean, there were other, there were steps taken here and there. So we really don't know. I mean, it was, there was some incrementalism. <laughs> and, and So I and guess Trump, what I'm saying is the day that they stopped the kids from going to school yeah. here. That, that was the first day I paid attention yeah. to it. Who are the big, who are the big promoters of the, of the hysteria in Canada? Well, just all the major media. All Same the major media. Else, yeah. uh, uh, I, I, was Trudeau also was Justin Trudeau also promoting it or was uh, oh yeah this will be the new normal until a vaccine yeah. is is and, I, you know, and, that, and what about your what about your, your own premiere in New Brunswick was he pretty bad too or oh yeah well see my first film is actually about that it's about like how the narratives were already shaped before COVID and yes. one of the big ones was the, the vaccine mandates yeah, well, <laughs> it doesn't matter what you think about vaccines. This was happening all over the United States. Um, and then in Canada, it happened here in my province. It, it was kind of like the dirty little back door. And it wasn't by doctors. It was the education minister who just resigned last week, by the way. And I think my film had a lot to do with that. I like to think because uh, it, ha- it had been out already. I already released the film. It sold in 10 countries. But the thing is, it got banned everywhere. So now I'm relaunching it with um, Odessa Orlowitz uh, from Liberty Talk, which is quite a big channel <laughs> in Canada. Vaccine Choice Canada. Um, I have, there's two executive producers. Like, I've got support this time. Like, they can't shut me down. And Liberty yes. Talk has their own social media, which is amazing. L-I-B-R-T-I dot com. Like, check it out it's it's a really amazing so i can't i'm not being censored this time 
Yeah, L R B L R L R L I R. What did I say? Anyway, it's it's L I B R Liber T I L I T I dot com. Yeah, I've not heard of them yet. We certainly know certainly some good alternative media. Of course, in America, you know, we have Odyssey, which is uh you know run by a good libertarian, Jeremy Kaufman. Uh, we also have Float, uh, which is which is um run by Aaron and Kingsley Edwards and float is spelled F L O T E Odyssey is spelled O D Y S E E. So. Yeah. And I know also Aaron and and Kingsley. Yeah. Yeah. uh, I've heard, I've heard, I've heard the guy that the CEO of bit shoot is also trying to be pretty good about this, but I, but, but they also have the problem of being located in the UK. I, I don't know though, but that's, so the, the most recent one was Vimeo. Like I, I you know, I had the pro yeah. account and everything. And I put it in so they yeah. kept me up. And so there was yeah. no way for me to make a return. And I mean, yeah. without a return, how do I even live? You know? Yeah, I, I don't I don't think you should trust yeah, trust Vimeo. I, I, I are are you uh I can't trust Vimeo, would, they shut down my account yeah. and everything. <laughs> I wouldn't trust Vimeo, I wouldn't trust Daily Motion either. Uh, yeah. And you know, and you had mentioned too that you actually had an issue with Subscribestar, and this is the first time I've heard about an issue with Subscribestar. Yeah, they just wouldn't approve my account, and yeah, I'm not the only one. Max Egan too, he had the same problem. Yeah. So I thought that was like a like a a bas- like a, a place yeah. I could go, you yes. know, like an alternative to Patreon or whatever. But well, they wouldn't even approve my account. Well, Subscribestar is yeah, Subscribestar is uh, is email email distribution, correct or yeah, I'm also going to mention I mean, I know that I was censoring Stefan Molyneux, but I wasn't. I, I'd not. I'd been telling people to try Subscribestar as an alternative, and now I'm hearing that Subscribestar is also a, a censorous yeah. platform. Now, in this series, this series starts pre-COVID, but it goes all the way to the convoy. I was in Ottawa. Yeah. I was right in the middle of it all, and and yeah. everything in between, right? And I got back from Ottawa, and uh, when GoFundMe had shut down the. Uh, a trucker's account essentially, which mm-hmm. had like what ten million dollars or something. It was a lot of money. They went to a, a site called Give Send Go, yes, uh, as an alternative. I got back from Ottawa uh, in about a couple, a month and a half, two months after. I thought like I needed money to keep this going, so I I I went. I was going to open a Give Send Go account. My IP address was banned. It literally said, "Your IP address is banned." <laughs> I yeah, that's that's very interesting. I, I, uh, yeah, find it interesting that all this is happening and all this censorship. So, so tell me what. Tell me more about the uh, truckers convoy. I'd like to. You were involved with that. I'd love to hear all the details about that when that happened and what your involvement was with it. Because a okay, lot, well, you know, there are a lot more people coming from the west than coming from the east. Obviously, but they all descended on Ottawa. I didn't realize how big it was going to be. I was hardly even really paying attention to it because uh, I really just wanted to edit. Like all, as far as I was concerned, all the production was done. I just had to edit, right? And uh, they got a hold of me. Uh, a few people involved in the convoy. I'm not going to mention them because of what they've done. And they wanted me to go and co- like in order to cover what was going on and they could cover my expenses. It was just supposed to be a weekend. So I thought, well, all it's going to really cost me is time. <laughs> a weekend. So I was actually in the pony truck that led the, the convoy from Eastern Canada to Ottawa. And it was amazing. Like, I, I couldn't believe what I what I was a part of. Like, there, like every single overpass from Moncton to Ottawa was packed full of people. Signs and there was airplanes. I remember that. That was cool. Like, there was these two airplanes came down, like, blowing smoke. You know what I mean? Like, like in the air shows and stuff there. Like, it was amazing. Like, the people were fed up. They were fed up. And uh, so anyway, like it's like a 15 hour drive. Um, we stopped overnight and we got to Ottawa. We were the first truck and the, and the police were like, we're only letting like five trucks in. And the guy I was with, he was, he was like, what? What are you talking about? There's like 26 kilometers of trucks behind us. Right? <laughs> like, <laughs> 
And uh, so pretty much we pretty much just going to roll through. What are you going to do? Like, and, uh, but the police were like, no, 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 listen, we're on your side. Like, we're sick of this too, but we just have to make this work. You know what I mean? So basically they were just letting so many trucks in so that we could, they could coordinate where we were going to park. So it wasn't that big of a deal. And as soon as I got there, like I, like we were like in Ottawa, there's this big, um, I think it's like the longest in the world, like a skating rink. So we're parked right beside that. And I'll mention this just because like to give you an idea how bizarre this kind of was for me. I jump out of the truck and it's cold in Ottawa. Like I'm on the East coast. It's cold in the winter, but this was like minus 35. Like that's cold. So I jump out of the truck with my camera to go get some shots. And, um, there's like um they had a fire going like here and there but like it, i found out later but in, in this particular instance like that was the first fire i saw and there was a girl like dancing minus 35 weather like shirtless braless everything <laughs> you know what I mean? but it was just the, the the relief of the people i guess but that was a bizarre thing to see <laughs> it was the first thing i saw was this girl like dancing with her boobs out so it was you know teach their own but um the the energy like because now the trucks are coming in we remember we were like one of the first we were i think the first trucks there was people coming in over from quebec they were walking over because they they wouldn't let cars in like it was massive it was massive and it was the biggest I've never seen anything like that. Like it was just community taking care of community and that's saying something because I went to a Mexican town in a culture on in Mexico and it's an, they kicked the government out and stuff. So I've seen that before. I've seen like a, a town that runs without government police or politicians, but this was like on a grand scale. Like you didn't have to buy food. People, I, I didn't buy food once. Like there are, you're turning food away They're like everybody's hugging it was amazing it was amazing and you know so that was like a week and a half i was there and then uh i had to come home partly because i was starting to dig into my own money like uh, and i couldn't really afford it because i just had so much to finish the film so i told myself like uh if i get home and the means come up i'll come back and I, I got home, I took care of what I had to do. And it was Pat King, who was like one of the, the head people of the convoy, who, who called me and, and was like, brother, we need you back here, man. I had already interviewed him at this point. Uh, he's a controversial figure. I like them. That's all I can say. There's a lot of people that think like, you know, he's a controlled opposition or whatever. I like them. So I, so I went back, I, I jumped in my car, I drove back and, uh, that's when they like two or three days after I got there is when the, they put the war measures act in. So we had two conference, they like Tamara Leach and, uh, Brian Pickford, I want to say his name is, he's like the last living guy that wrote the charter rights and freedoms. They had a press conference, uh, like a hold the line press conference. And then the next day, um, Pat King and his crew had their hold the line conference. And then at that point, my car was actually starting to break down. Like it was like everything underneath was frozen. It didn't matter how many car washes I went through or whatever. And I thought there was going to be like a standstill. Like I didn't think the government was really going to do this. And so I, I drove home and I had to put a thousand dollars of repairs in my car, but a, the next day is when they started beating people up and trampling them with horses and and uh and uh my friend dan dix was there and he got beat up like uh from press for truth uh so luck hopefully i can get that footage from so i can include that <laughs> you know yes <clears throat> oh dan dix yeah, that's right dan dix is canadian too isn't he yeah yeah but he but he's yeah but he but he came but he i think he's based out of vancouver right yeah he's on the west coast like 
<clears throat> yeah, we've I'm got on the some, east. He's on the west. Like, yeah, so. we've we've got some we've got some good indie indie journalists up in Canada. It's uh, good to. And, good and that. the girl from Rebel News, like they shot her in the face with a friggin' with uh, the the gas canisters which, there. Which girl from Rebel News? Well, I don't know her name, but I can tell you Brittany this: Brittany Pettibone. Uh, she she was right beside me at the press conference uh, with. <clears family. throat> Not Lori Southern, but no. No, 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 no. no. And, uh, she she's French, but uh, like uh, you know, like. But they they yeah. they literally just they sh like they were targeting alternative media. Yeah, and I know Rebel Muse is one of the more alternative. They've got some uh, good alternative media. I also know there's Druthers. Uh, that's a they're actually putting out a newspaper in Canada. Yeah. Uh, Rebel. Who else is with Rebel Muse? Yeah, let me see if we can figure out who that is. I. I know you said a French Faith Goldie. No, I don't. I, I wouldn't know. I'd have to see her face. She was on the high wire like the next week. The, the high wire had her on there with Del Big Tree. Del Big Tree is in my film, yes. by the way. Del Big Tree, yeah. Del Big Tree, yeah. <coughs> He's in my film. Uh, yeah, I interviewed yeah. him in 2019. Yes. And yeah. he actually said the words, This is a pharmaceutical new normal. <laughs> he said that in 2019. Yeah, it, it seems as though some of these people were. Yeah, it's, it does sound like they. Uh, I think a lot of people were aware of the, some of the things that the pharmaceuticals were doing. I, uh, Canada doesn't. Uh, Canada doesn't have any pharmaceutical companies, doesn't it? Is, is is it all just the American pharmaceutical companies? Funny you should mention that because in twenty, I want to say it was twenty eighteen. Um, the Shermans, who were, um, they made uh, generic versions of a lot of drugs. They weren't very liked by the pharmaceutical companies. Um, and they also made hydroxychloroquine. And they were murdered uh, just like two years. I was I was in Acapulco when it happened. I remember like that's when I went to Toronto, actually. And uh, they were murdered and brutally murdered and even put in like these weird poses. Um, and nothing ever came of it. There's not even a suspect for this thing. So you can look into that, but the the Shermans, yeah, like uh, so that as far as the pharmaceutical company, that would have been one of them. Yeah, but is it is it just American pharmaceutical companies going into Canada, or was it? Well, that's all. I, that's all I can say. I don't know. Like I, yeah, I just don't some of that yeah. research really. But the Shermans, who had a, uh, like who made generic versions and hydroxychloroquine, which is very important, I think, were murdered <laughs> two years before. You yeah, know, I, make, make that up what you will, but you know. Yes, I'm trying to see who that might. Who, who that? Yeah, you know, I, I was looking up seeing who that French, French, uh, French female from Rebel Days might have been. I don't see who that is. She's very pretty. Yeah. Like that's yeah. that's the best hint I could give you. But she's well, very they they try to put pretty women on TV. Uh, there's a reason for that. They, well, I know I work in TV. <clears throat> yeah, you work in TV. It's a. Or I did. I quit in 2018. Like I and I and I posted it online. I shut down my company and everything because something you need to know is I made a film about a man named Rick Simpson in 2013 who was claiming to uh, be healing people with cannabis oil. He kind of stumbled on it because of his own injury, and that changed my direction forever. Like you know, including cancer. And I, I just saw too much. I saw the corruption. I saw too much. Like, uh, I could never really look back. So the I really saw the media. for free. Yeah. Do you think taking government money out of media would get rid of the corruption? Or do you think maybe there's, maybe this, maybe this is a profession that just attracts these kind of ideologues? Ask me that again. I didn't quite grasp what said if if you had a complete separation of media and government in canada would the media get better or do you think media just attracts a, a lot of socialist ideologues naturally for other reasons besides the fact that it's well i think we can the answer to that would be within, <clears throat> within the internet because yes. it already is kind of like that there is no government involved in that right rebel news and yes. and myself and dan dix press for truth and whatever so i think that kind of answers your question uh, we're not being funded by government clearly yes <clears throat> uh, 
who else was uh, in, involved with these rallies? I, I I don't pay much attention to Stefan Molyneux, but was he he was promoting them? I assume was he or or not? I haven't paid attention to Stefan Molyneux for a long time, so I can't really comment on that. Like I I used to watch him. I thought he was pretty cool there, but yeah, it's got to be like three four years. I he was he was much more libertarian than he was uh, recently, but yeah, yeah, issues issues pertinent to Canadians. I mean, he's he's out of Toronto. Uh, and, it, and it's not anything like uh, that. I I just lost interest. Like uh, yeah. you know, I have nothing bad to say about him. I just lost interest in what he had oh, to say. There's a, there's a lot of different reasons. Up. What what was the makeup? What was the general makeup of the rallies uh, in 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 Canada? It, it it seems like the rallies in America got very much. Ta- very much associated with Donald Trump, but it, uh, but how were the rallies in Canada? Because obviously Donald Trump's not a factor in Canada. Was it were they were they carrying names of anybody anybody running for office, or was it pretty much a lot of different people? I've I've heard the rallies in Canada. It seems that the rallies in Canada were a little more diverse. I can only speak to the rallies I went to in New Brunswick, and New Brunswick's a really interesting place because it's like the only completely bilingual city that I know of, like there's in Canada. Yeah. So there, that, which is a weird dichotomy because we've learned to live with each other. Like I'm, I, I speak French, I'm Acadian um, and English and it's just the norm here. Like we all kind of, you know, there, there was a divide for a very long time and, uh, it's gone. So as far as like protests and things like that in New Brunswick, it was really these two sides coming together. There was no divide because of the common um, threat to us, I guess you want to yes. say. But I also know some people who were protesting this who were who would probably be considered left wing in Canada. And I didn't see many left wingers in America at all, although there were a few who came out who came out in favor of. It seemed like the maybe they just were suppressed. Yeah, and 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 definitely one thing I've gotten the impression of, is this was something that really brought English and French together. Yeah, yeah. As far as like the the larger scale, like Quebec and the rest of Canada, basically, <laughs> I mean, that that did happen. You know, like Quebecers for the first time were were waving Canada flags. You know, like wow, they, like, yeah, that that's wild. I mean, the, and that the English and French really was the first time they ever came out and protested together on anything. Yeah, just because they were they realized, and I think that is one of the beautiful things about freedom is you can truly have some unity when you live in a free society where people agree to disagree. I mean, what do you think makes New Brunswick un- un- unique? What I mean, what makes them makes the English and French live together as well as they do? Is it because the government just isn't mandating things, or they don't feel the need to go into their tribes? No, I don't know. It's it's just like it's not a very big province. We have to put up with each other. There was a time where the English were oppressing uh, the French quite bad, but those those wars of like, or those battles have already been fought. Yeah, and uh, I I don't really know what else to say. We just live amongst each other. There is no real divide anymore. It's just you know. But at one time it was pretty severe. It was pretty severe. So yeah. I, I hope that answers your question. I don't know. My, like, myself, like, um, I, my father was English and my mother is Acadian, you know? And when I say English, I mean English speaking. My last name is Harrigan, so, you yes, know, I'm Irish, I guess, like, you know? Yeah. <coughs> and, Harrigan, and Scottish no, and Acadian. We're just a bunch of mutts here in Canada, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Har- Harrigan is definitely if you if you know you probably know that song Harrigan that's me you know H A W R I G A N yeah, yeah. yeah that's a, that's a, that's a that's a very a very Irish song it's a very yeah. much a part of their history yeah so it's a, so there was a lot of fence jumping here in yeah. New Brunswick between the well, Irish and the Scottish and the Acadians and you know and, well, and, and, and the natives like you know I, I, I'm going to take a guess that Canada probably got I suppose Canada got a lot of Irish immigrants back in the 1840s like America did but. I, all I know is my ancestors. Yeah. It was two brothers that showed up here, and every yeah. Harrigan 
here is related to them. So that's yeah, all. But, there, but there's been Irish immigration a, a lot you know, to the Western Hemisphere throughout. And they're very like similar yeah. cultures. You know what I mean? Musically and mm -hmm. uh, like the Acadians and the Irish, uh, you know, like the, the kind of music that they played. And, and they're just happy-go-lucky people in, in a certain yeah. way. And we were all poor. And I think that has a lot to do with who we are also like at one time like these all these people were poor and their their common thread was community music you know what i mean like that kind of thing <clears throat> so that yeah that's that's my comment i don't know i yeah, think i lost my train of thought yeah, music and stuff. <laughs> yeah so uh so i so anything else, uh, what 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 lessons do you think uh, were that can the liberty movement learn from the, the experience with the truckers uh and, and, the, and the convoys well i think the world did learn like i mean if you think about it that convoy ended it ended it worldwide and then like three days later it was the ukraine war kind of thing so but that was the that was the last thing you know like the convoy happened like you piss off canadians enough people have to remember we go through really cold winters together and we're very tolerant people but we go through very cold winters together. We're tough. And that's what happened. They pushed us too far. Yes, and I was I, so happy to see it because I had really given up on my country. I was like, you know, like I'd given up on Canada. I really did. Like I, I was disgusted with what I was seeing. Um, people weren't rising up. We weren't allowed to go to grocery stores or they, they tried that. Well, I mean, they everything. They were going to take our kids if we didn't give them the Corona vaccine. It was uh, it was intense, and I've never worn a mask, and I didn't get the jab, and fuck those guys. Like that's all I got to say about it. You know, I wasn't bending to any of it because I could see through it. You know, I I knew it, I knew what was going on. Obviously, there were obviously there were some Canadians who uh, bought into all of this. The whole oh, the majority, yeah. the majority did, yeah, yeah. It seems as though uh, if you want to have a freedom movement, a small minority will fight for things. And if you get, uh, uh, yeah, some people have said ten. If ten percent disobey, then it's it's not going to happen. It's, well, that's right. Lost, it's not, it's it's not the majority that changed history; it's the minority. Yes, <laughs> but we yeah. also have. But I. But you know. But this was all calculated. It seems like by a bunch of well placed intellectuals. And you know, cynically speaking. Uh, I've said this, if, if Putin had invaded Ukraine exactly two years earlier, we would have been saved from all of this. Yeah, I, you know, like, I don't know as much as probably I should about the Ukraine, so I'm not going to really comment on it, but I know it's been going on for a long time. It's like eight yeah. years that something yes. could have happened here. But, Why three days after the convoy? I can say that. But, but when, but when the invasion of, but when the invasion of Ukraine happened, coronavirus disappeared from them exactly that's what that's the design I mean, and if something and i was just thinking you know when it was happening if back in february of 2020 if what what will it take to make this disappear from the media and i thought well maybe a natural disaster like a hurricane but well, this was something else too because <laughs> yeah yeah well then it's it's always the distraction right like it's look yeah. over here and i mean remember i worked i was the brainwasher for 20 years yeah. like we, we, and it's just part of the business like you're not really yeah. trying to do that but you have yes. a 15 minute interview that needs to become a minute and a half like uh, what were some of the brainwashings that that happened during your career i mean what what did you sell sell to people that really well on some level it's all brainwashing like that's what i mean like because it all has to be reduced yes. so it really it just becomes about the integrity of the director you know, and who you're selling to because it's pre-sold, yes. you know? Well, well, you know, for example, you know, you know, obviously what, what was, for example, the reaction in Canada after the world trade center? I mean, obviously that didn't happen on Canadian soil, but that was something that, you know, was on the news everywhere in the world. That's an interesting question because that's the year I got out of, um, uh, th that I finished college and it, it really took me about eight months to get a job. Um, and my first job was as a producer and cameraman and everything else, but for local television. 
I did that for a year, and then my second job was for Discovery Channel on a uh, series called Stones of Fate and Fortune. So that period of time, I wasn't working for television, so I can't really say. Like, I, I can only say what I saw. Like, I just like everybody else, I woke up that morning. My girlfriend was like, "You got? They just hit the World Trade Centers." I was like, "What's the World Trade Centers?" I'm like, I didn't even know. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I knew something was weird. Like when I saw it happen, you know, like I. I remember thinking, well, oh, that's bizarre. Like, you know, but were they, but is, were they promoting all this insanity? Like terrorists are everywhere. We've got to yeah, hide from terrorists. My friend, my friend's I mean, dad, my best friend's dad was an air traffic controller. Right. And this guy, like, he didn't, he, he didn't really like, uh, he, he was soft spoken. Is that the way to say it? Like he, like strong and silent kind of guy. And we were talking about this and I remember he said, you know, boys like to hit the tower like that with a plane that's one thing he said but to hit the pentagon the way they did he said that's one in a million and that like whoa and that night um we went to we had a Le uh a lebanese friend and he really told me all about like that night i remember it was it was a strange day about like uh the war in Lebanon and how like the uh, geopolitical side of it, like he had escaped at one point he went to Cyprus because there was a conflict between the Jewish faction and the, uh, the Christians and he didn't agree with it and he left. But I really like, I saw things in a totally different light that day because of what he had told me, like the, the Americans had like pushed this conflict and they were um, promising support. But when the conflict started, they just stayed in the boats and didn't do a thing, you know. Like it was, it was, it was a weird day. It was a weird day. I can imagine. Was there anything else that happened in in Canada that you thought that was kind of a somewhat of a psyop or anything like that? I mean, anything that might have particular to Canada that we because we really don't we really don't hear much about what happens in in Canada down here. How about this? Maybe I shouldn't talk about it because Alex Jones just got sued for a billion dollars. But like in in Nova Scotia, here like uh, when COVID started, there was a mass shooting by a guy yes. that, that was in an RCMP car, and he had been paid out a whole bunch of money, like a half a million dollars. Dan Dix reported on this, and McLean's McLean's is like a it's like New York Times or whatever for Canada. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's mainstream. So it was a little bizarre that they said it. And like, and this is how apparently the RCMP pay informants and stuff. Like, who goes to the bank and takes out half a million bucks, right? You, you can't do it. And so this guy went on a, a shooting rampage in an RCMP card, car, and in full RCMP. You know, and then of course the very next day it was Justin Trudeau was like, "Oh, we got to take all your guns away." You know. Yes. So make that what you want, but that's, that that yes. to me smells pretty bad. RCMP Royal Canadian Mounted Police, which is basically like a national police force, right? Yeah, they're actually a branch of the military, as I understand it, but <laughs> we don't talk about that. Yeah, I wondered because so they're a branch of the military, so there's not a complete separation of military and police like there is in America. Yeah, that was very interesting. What do, do you think? What, how did, how did Canada with its, I'd like curious, how did Canada with its, with generally a tradition of, you know, coming from the English liberalism and still wanting to, at least hoping to have some, how did, how did Canada become disarmed? Well, okay, listen, I think it was kind of a collective agreement, you know, for a long time, like I, I, I didn't, Canada kind of had this arrogance to it. We thought we had it all right, like, you know, half socialist, half capitalist, like, you know, we had free Medicare. And, all yeah. that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think everybody just kind of agreed that we didn't need guns, like in, in a sense, like, you know, like I remember growing up like that, thinking guns were bad. No, I don't think that anymore. I think everybody should have one because of everything that's happened. You know, if you're if your government goes corrupt, then, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. Right. Like. Well, yeah, and of course, in in Canada, you're still also still you know worried a little more about a, a grizzly bear or a moose coming down at you. I mean, that 
you know, it's. <laughs> well, not anymore. Canada is Canada, <laughs> still a very, there's still a lot of really wild <laughs> spots in Canada. I'm sorry. What? There's still a lot of really wild places in Canada. I mean. Oh yeah. Like the majority of it is, is woodland and you know, yeah. like it's just sparse, like you'll drive days between cities. Like, yes. Yeah. So as far as the gun question, and and recently Justin Trudeau said like um, the right to bear arms, like to defend yourself with arms, like Canadians do not have that right. We don't have that right. Like somebody comes out there and you're trying to kill you and you shoot them, like you're going to jail. Yeah. Oh, interesting that you have more optimism for Canada. Where do you think Canada's? Where do you think Canada is going to go, move on from this? Do you think? Canada will become a more libertarian country in the next 10 or 20 years? Or do you think Canada is going to continue to elect people like Trudeau? I don't know. Well, you got to remember Trudeau got in because he offered to legalize pot. Like it was like the Trojan horse, right? So as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't matter which side gets voted in. It's the same as anywhere else. It's Coke and Pepsi and it's the same... You know, like we have this guy right now. I can't think of his name. He's the conservative guy that everybody's like, oh, he's going to come save the day. But I've seen evidence that, you know, and his platform is getting rid of anybody because Klaus Schwab bragged that he came to Canada, like when Trudeau got elected, and he was really happy to see that over at least half of the cabinet were his young, his former young um global leaders yes like from his school like so he was bragging about that yeah so this guy this new guy he's like vowing to kick out anybody who's associated with the world economic forum however i have seen evidence through the wayback machine that he himself was part of the world economic forum polivier polivier i think his name no yeah, that's his last name polivier Anyway, they're to me they're all the same. Like, they're, if if a career politician is, is a career politician, they know how to play the game. There was Maxime Bernier was the big hope um, because there was a snap election that Trudeau made, and I don't know how he possibly won, but I would guess that maybe yes. it was stolen. Mm-hmm. I can't prove that. But everybody hated Trudeau at that point, so I was like, how, how did he manage to get back? <laughs> Can you explain what a snap election is? Well, he just called the election, so it was like within uh, like election of parliament months, or an election of what? Like, well, an election election, like the federal election. But but who who is elected in this election? Well, he was. But it was so the timing of it was is very strategic. So it's and, just a, a new election of the prime minister, or what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay, I'm just, just I'm just the trying same to as like in a state. So you're voting locally, but who you're voting for locally it essentially like yeah decides who the but premium. that's not a term you ever hear in America is the term snap election because from what I hear the the terms are more irregular. It's just kind of like when we need to have a, an election, we have an election or something like that. Yeah, I, there you go. I, I don't know, but I can tell you that. And so the big hope at that point was Maxime Bernier, and I was mm-hmm. even asked to run, and this yeah. was the people's party of canada ppc i was even asked to run yes and, and i was like no like i just I, yeah it's too broken you can't fix it with is, government. is the people's party of canada is that the libertarian party or yeah well it would be more towards that i wouldn't say it like I, I i don't know if you could label it that because i think there is a libertarian party in canada but maxim bernier in my mind was also a career politician he signed us on to agenda 2030 he was one of the guys that did that you know, so that's a UN yeah. agenda for those who don't know. Yes. Uh, do Canadians have a pretty positive opinion of the UN, or what? How do they feel about the UN up there? I can't speak for all Canadians. Okay. I don't have a very good opinion of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What was uh? You know, who was uh? Was there? Were, you know, were there any counter counter protests or counter demonstrations to the truckers? Did anybody, any any of the the mob come out and say yes, we want to? wearing their masks come out and say yes we we need to maybe the mob came out and tried to forcibly vaccinate them or i don't know was there anything like that in in, in during the convoys or 
I didn't see any of it, but mm-hmm. I know what's going on because it's actually in court right now. Like just just Justin uh, Trudeau is going to have to uh, actually uh, testify. Like this is going through court right now. So these people, there are some people who are like, oh my god, all the all the honking. <laughs> you know I mean? Yes, it was terrifying. <laughs> yeah, well, well, Trudeau responded kind of a kind of in a crazy manner by that because he seemed to double down when the protests happened. Well, he's a, he's a huge um, fan of China. I mean, he said that openly. Yes. So. And their and their basic dictatorship. I think you can remove the word basic. You know? <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting. You you mentioned you know you do have more faith in Canada after this, which is which is maybe a good thing to hear. Maybe we can, maybe Canada can go in the right direction because. Yeah, you know, it wasn't unusual back in during the Vietnam War for a lot of uh, American draft dodgers to go to Canada and other people like that. And I, I don't, I don't see any Americans going to Canada now. And of course, and of course, Canadians come to America to get health care. Uh, oh, people were were like fleeing, fleeing, and I, I just about left myself. But I have a son here, and I, uh, yes. unless I could bring him. I, I wasn't and, gonna go, but there was literally like there was a family that froze to death trying to cross the border um, through the woods, like uh, going to America. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah, it was a lot of people went to Mexico. A ton of people went to Mexico. Yeah. But at the end of October, uh, like as of November November first, you couldn't fly anymore. You couldn't you couldn't travel. We were literally yeah. prisoners in our country here. Like yeah. Yeah, so it really, uh, a lot of these restrictions came and went, uh, and and really did it. And how long did all of this go? I mean, what what were some of the worst restrictions you you saw? I mean, what was the worst? I don't know. It's just you couldn't go anywhere without a mask. Uh, I was in a, a meeting with Rocco Galati, who is one of Canada's top. I think he is Canada's top constitutional lawyer, and he told us like. You don't need an exemption. Like, just when you go in, if anybody says anything to you, just say, I'm exempt. Mm -hmm. You don't need a doctor to sign that, you know? So we were kind of armed with that, but that didn't go very far. Like, I mean, like, it was, in fact, in part two of my film, of this series, Tiptoe to Tyranny is the name of the series. This first Mm -hmm. film is called Tiptoe to Tyranny First Steps. It, but then, and it's pre COVID into COVID. The next film is uh, largely based around uh, a story that Rebel News covered. They said it was one of the worst they heard, had heard in Canada, and I have it intimately because they live here. And it was a couple named um, Nick DeAngelis, Brittany Green, and there was another guy, Dave West. And uh, they were protesting outside of City Hall, they actually have medical exemptions. They were arrested. They were thrown in solitary for five days. Solitary, each. And um, Dave, he got thrown into the psychiatric ward uh, for 30 days. And this guy's not an idiot. He drives a Hummer. He's married to a doctor. Like, you know what I mean? They were torturing these people. And the, the trials went on, like, into the summer here like you know and they won they won eventually but they had medical exemptions they were thrown in jail for not wearing a mask outdoors outdoors in the winter yes Uh, one thing yeah one thing i do i do respect is it doesn't seem like the protests really and the rallies really uh, died down because of the cold weather the canadians went out and especially toronto and just went out and even even in the middle of january they were out there protesting it was the day of the I convoy really was the coldest that. day of the year. It was what? the coldest day of the year. And listen, it was funny because the windshield wipers, you know, the thing that spray the, uh, like the, the windshield. The wiper fluid, yes. Yeah, the wiper fluid, right? Ours broke. So we had to keep the window open because <laughs> it keeps spraying it on. And I was in the back. And it was freezing and and then we had the switch and we literally had like a tent in the back that we had built it was so cold it was so cold again and i'm and I, again i'm on the east coast it's cold here in the winter but like that was frigid like i don't envy anybody who's in ottawa like 
it's certainly uh, it's certainly very uh, very interesting to see what Canadians do in the cold weather. I or what anybody does to deal with the cold weather. They really learn to deal with it and just kind of see it as a challenge. Although a lot of a lot of people also, and, and maybe that's why some Canadians ended up going to Mexico as well too. I mean, it was a and you know yeah. what, Mexico, yeah. like Acapulco is way too hot for me. Like I, I prefer yeah. like Morelia up in the mountains and stuff. Like yeah. Acapulco is like so I, I don't know, like yeah, you're right. Is like, there... used to be cold, but we, we, I like fall. Are <laughs> there weird. any other are there any other mass migrations happening in Canada? Like maybe, you know, people moving from Ontario to Saskatchewan or anything like that? I mean I'm gonna say yes and more to Alberta. Al- Alberta is kind of like Canada's Texas, you know what I mean? Like, it's they don't put up with a lot of shit there. <laughs> you know? I've I've heard that. I know they have the I know they have the Calgary Stampede, and they have a lot of cowboy stuff there, and there's also a lot of oil there, of course. Yeah, and and, and it's a uh, you know, I... well, my province is retired is very corrupt, and we are owned by an oil company, Irving Oil. Or, and uh, oh, they really own this. I've talked to UN doctors that have told me that it's well known around the world that New Brunswick is one of the most corrupt places to make uh, environmental business deals because we have like worse than third world countries. Our laws are terrible here. They spray us with glyphosate or glyphosate. Like, um, if, if, I've had people send me videos. Like country kids are getting cancer, like you know, kids. Oh wow! And this one woman, two of her kids got cancer out in the country. She sends me a video, just with her cell phone. Hundreds, thousands of bees just dead on the side of the road. What does that? Wow, uh, that's very. I, I didn't. What What made the situation in New Brunswick like that? It's just uh, Irving, like this guy, he just got very, very rich and became very, very powerful and basically walked mm-hmm. into Parliament one day. It, it, there's even like a law here that they can't be yeah. taxed. They can't be taxed. So Irving Oil, like Alberta's rich because of the oil, but here the refinery uh, can't be taxed. And he basically put that law in place, so, you know. Fills up his trucks at his own gas stations, and and he's dead now. But I mean, like it's it's a it's a it's a corporation, like you know. But yeah, yeah. So New Brunswick well, is very corrupt, like in that sense. And and the premier, our premier, um, used to work for Irving Oil. Oh, you know? yeah. You mentioned you mentioned that New Brunswick has a lot of problems. Well, that's the that's the crux of it. Yeah, you know, it's a very poor province. All Eastern Canada um, is very poor, as far as and we shouldn't be. I mean, we got everything here. You know, we've got, we're right beside the ocean. We have like all of the fish, and we got the woods, and we got yeah. minerals, and we have everything you'd ever want. Like you know, have have the environment environmentalists put a nix on timbering, or is that part of the issue, or? Well, I mean, it goes on. It, it, I, I don't know if it, there, you don't see a lot of that here because a lot of people work for Irving. Oh, okay, yeah. It's okay. just kind of part of daily, daily life. And, and you don't see, like, the clear cutting and stuff because they do it kind of behind. Like, you'd be driving down the highway and you'd never know, you know, because the trees are there. But, like, you know, half a kilometer after, like, beyond that, like, it's being clear cut all over, like, that kind of thing, right? So you, you don't see it visually, and unless you do, yeah. and we 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 protested against the uh, the spraying of glyphosate and stuff, and uh, you know we want to keep them at least away from the watershed, and we managed to yeah, win so. that. We we protest we protested against the uh, they were going to do the was it called shale gas like the fracking, and we won that. Like uh, we're mighty. I mean, my first film is how we. Again, like this vaccine mandate was coming in, they were going to try to push it through here for kids to go to school. Like your kid literally couldn't go to school, and we we beat that bill, and the reincarnation of it, 
And this time with a notwithstanding clause, first time it was used in Canada. So it can't be charter challenged for five years. And we beat that. And we beat that into COVID. Again, these are the narratives that were already put in place before COVID. Yeah. I'm not creating a narrative in my films. I'm just letting the, the viewer make up their own mind. And yes. for anybody watching, the premiere, the relaunch of it, because I've been banned everywhere, is October 29th at tiptoepremiere.com. Tiptoepremiere.com. And uh, we're going to have a QA. and a I got some major doctors in the film, too. There's Dr. Meryl Nash. Mm -hmm. She was in uh, Pandemic 2. Yeah. Some people might know her. Yeah. Uh, are, Dr. Bob Spears and uh, J uh, Dr. James Lyons Wheeler, yeah. and they're going to also be in the Q and A. So yes. the hope is we're going to raise enough money through this that I can put it out for free and not have to worry about finishing the other films, right? Like because it's been a struggle. I've run out of money. Like, a, like I've been homeless through this, partly because I ran out of money and partly because I wouldn't get vaccinated. Yes. What? Uh, what other? What other? Are there? What are some other good movies out there that cover the the Corona situation right now? In your view? Well, I don't know. There's a, there. There's one that uh, you can see for free. I think it was it was a few weeks ago on the High Wire. They played the whole thing, and it's it's like a a producer from the BBC who like defected, yes. like myself, like he jumped ship. And it's the mm -hmm. like one of the first doctors that took the injection um, in order to combat hesitancy. And now he's all about shutting the whole thing down. So yeah, that's that would be a very good one. I, yeah. would, I, would say. I, I know there's been some other documentaries out there. I mean, who who have been some of the who have been some of the big heroes heroes in Canada during all this? I mean, you besides the truckers, of course, have there been anybody in parliament or anybody in a an important position who's talked about this well i i think some people would say this uh the, the conservative guy pierre i remember his name on pierre polyver some people would say him because he's you know he's against the world economic forum and he's kind of like as far as like really heroes as soon as you said outside of the truckers i can't really speak because those were the yeah. heroes to yeah, they definitely Lee. were the heroes. I thought there were people in parliament or people in the media. And and all uh, that's divided too. Like even I, when we were when we were in Ottawa, like it branched off. Like the, it's a terrible thing about the freedom movements. Like it 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 splits. And then mm -hmm. these people don't like these people, and these people don't like these people. Yes. You know, so there was some pretty big people like Chris Guy was a big um influence. Yeah. I know who Chris I, Guy I interviewed is, yeah. Chris Guy. There was Pat King. I interviewed Pat King. Tamara Leach. Um, there's some really good alternative medias like uh, Laura Lynn Thompson, uh, Laura Lynn Live. Like, she's really good. I interviewed her. I was on her show about the film. Um, let's see. But, again, all these people become controversial. Like, there's some people you can't, you can't even talk to about Pat King. You know what I mean? Oh, no, he's a this and he's a that. And Chris Guy, he's a this and he's a that. Yeah. So... And, and it's hard to tell what the truth is. You don't know, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, you, you, you definitely don't know. It's a, it's a going. So is Canada went back to normal by now, or is Canada still uh, languishing up, uh, under some of this stuff? Um, the people just are done with it, you know. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like I've. I would probably compare it to the United States. Like, I don't know if this is factual, but I heard like the, the uptake for the boosters in the States was like 2%. Like the people are just done with it. It's like, uh, you know, it's a. Uh... Canada was a huge disappointment for me. I was yeah, terrified. The people were just bending to anything that was happening. You know what I mean? Like it, it was a daily, it was a daily thing having to fight people about the masks and cause I wouldn't wear one. <laughs> and a lot of places like the, like this was interesting. They did this twice. So the first time they brought in all the mandates and stuff like that, I would just call ahead to anywhere I was going. And then you kind of, and, and really they would roll out the red carpet for me. Like most of the time, and you kind of now you had your places you could go shop and they're generally pretty happy to see me because nobody wanted to do this 
And you know what I mean? They were like, oh, there's the guy that doesn't, <laughs> right? Um, so, but the second time around is when it really got insane. Like, and, and I, and I don't know, maybe because of my background in psychology, I get it. Like, you know, like it was certain kind of conditioning. Like the first time, you know, we had, you know, if the people had exemptions or whatever, like, you know, like people were trying to work it out. But the second time there was no working it out. Like, didn't matter if you had an exemption or not, you're not getting in. Like, you know, it was, it was, and they were threatening. I mean, they were threatening the businesses and stuff with fines and everything else. And they were scared for their businesses. You know, we, we had already been through a lot. A lot of businesses had already shut down, you know, because of loss of business and all that. Yeah, it really was. I mean, I did, did and people, uh, hardly anybody on the American left understood that this was actually going to enrich the richest people that you know they supposedly hate the super rich the billionaires and they didn't understand seem to get it that this would make the billionaires even richer right i that i know i i can't even get my head around a lot of that stuff like you know a lot of these people you would think they, they would you know the pharmaceutical companies like they're kind of against that kind of thing like capitalism and all that like you know they're more like on the socialist side, I think. Um, so you would think that they would, <laughs> you know what I mean, put two, two together. And but I, I can't comment. I'm not. I'm not in America and or in the United States. Sorry, I am in America. It's Canada. <clears throat> I can just say what I saw here, you know. And I just happen to be in the province where they tried to do everything first. It's like Canada's dirty little back door. They were literally going to come and take our kids from us. That's a scary situation. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds, it, yeah, it definitely sounds like they're, although it also sounds like some places in Canada are better than others, but yeah. And it's not done. I, I, I have a friend who works in the school system. He was telling me the other day that they're already gearing them up for another lockdown. Yeah. Uh, has there been a move out of the schools in Canada because of this or not? How has that affected the schools? I mean, that's one possibly positive thing that could come from all this. Yeah, a lot of parents took their kids out of school. We, we did. My so kids back in school now because he he, he wants. But is it? But is it? But is it leading to more unschooling, homeschooling? I would say yes. Yeah. I would say yes, but I don't know the statistics or anything. But I. I yeah, I think a lot of people did yeah. take their kids out of school. So yeah, so it's going to be interesting. To, uh, so your your film, yeah. So it's definitely been a interesting talk. I don't know where uh, it's going going to be interesting to see where Canada goes and where where really where a lot of the English speaking countries go. Uh, do you think Canada was better or worse than Australia or New Zealand, or uh, do you have an? I would say it's on par, people? right? Like it seemed yeah. like there were like there were just. You know the same i think new zealand got it a little worse though like um because that yacinda is that her name there like, she, like Jacinda were, Ardern, yeah she's 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 horrible uh yeah like i think they were literally like putting people in camps and not letting them yeah. out unless they got yeah. I, I th you know one, one thing that factored into all of this is australia and new zealand are both islands and it seems as though the island countries uh, because you have that barrier, I mean, you, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure if I wanted to uh, figure out the right place, I, I could, you know, I could go out into the forest and just walk into Canada if I wanted to. But in yeah. an island country, you can't do that. Right. Right. And, and so that, so you have a lot. So the points of entry are definitely much more, much easier to control. And Yeah. And my only point of reference for what was going on yeah. in, Australia really was Max Egan. He's also in my in the yes. series. So I I was seeing through that eye what was yeah. going on, and it was bad in Australia. It was really bad. Yeah, and and you I don't know. You're probably aware of some other films out there like Plandemic or Oh, I, Mickey Willis. I'm a big fan. Really uh, Plandemic actually interesting stuff out there. Uh, yep. Uh, who who are the sources in Canada that you think are trustworthy? I mean, you, you've Me. mentioned a few. <laughs> okay. Dan Dix. Dan Dix, Dan Dix yes. uh, Laura Lynn Thompson, 
uh, Odessa Orlowitz uh, from Liberty Talk. She's, uh, Why? she's an executive on this now. Is uh, that is that really his name, Dan Dix? I mean, you you have a name that sounds like a, a porn star. <laughs> you know? I know. When he got married, I said it's going to be a lot easier to do those jokes now that you're two. <laughs> the Dix. <laughs> yeah, we are. Yeah, it's a. Uh, but but, but, but yeah, Dan's the, a great guy, you know. But, and, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. These people bust their butts. I really, I really have a lot. Yeah, of he's got like, like for lack of better, that guy's the independent got journalist. I mean, Dan he's Dix. I know, and, and I he's think he's not very think, tall either. I was really surprised when I met Dan. He's, he's not a very tall guy. And, like, and I think didn't somebody was it him? Was it was it Dan or was it somebody else who got attacked? Uh, broke his camera or something? I remember. Well, Dan were, got attacked at the at the convoy. Like they 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 you know yeah. broke his ribs there. Like yeah, but he's been. I think yeah, it's uh, yeah. I didn't. Yeah, Dan Dix, Del Big Tree, and uh, there's some other good people out there. Uh, Anarcho Polko, uh, you, know, you know, I met I met you down at that scene. They they invited a lot of good independent journalists there. That was always one of the better things about that conference. They certainly uh, brought them in. Uh, yeah, they, they, well, I mean that's that's what that really veered my direction. Like it was that conference, like because everybody I ever wanted to interview was going to be there. Like um, G. Edward Griffin, uh, I got Cynthia McKinney, Derek Bros, Jeff Berwick, yeah, uh, Max Egan. I could go on, right? I got them all because they hired me. Like as I, yeah. I, I called and said I was going to come down, and yeah, I, I intended to get some interviews for a documentary, and they, they were like, "Oh, can you come down a few days before and help us out?" You know, like so they wound up hiring me. It, 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 that's where I got these interviews two years before this whole COVID fiasco. It was already these people were predicting something like this, you know, to the to the yeah. point where I could I could marry it up, and you would never know, you know. It, it, yeah. Originally, what? that was going to be the film. Like that's all yeah. I was going to do. I was, was going to take these old interviews and marry them up with current events. And it's still like that. Only I kept covering everything that happened, so I added a whole new layer, you know. Like, but those are still in there. And they're pre they're two years before COVID. Yeah, it, it seems it seems as though possibly yeah, it, it's interesting that they actually were predicting it. I don't know that many people who predicted it and, and, and did they really predict that it would be of this nature or did they well no, not specifically, like not a virus or this, but yeah. I mean, everybody the big question I was like that threw everybody off, no matter who I would talk to, was where do you see the world in five years from now? Yeah, that was the question in twenty eighteen. Yes. Was yeah. My last question. Everybody, everybody stumbled on that. Yeah. Because things were so in the air, like it could go. Like, yeah. It's either what, they're going to win or we're going to win, but there seems to be no middle road. <laughs> yeah. I, I assume. I assume you're aware. Are you aware of the the Deagle report? I know that term or word. Uh, that was yeah. a that was a site where they where they they took it down, but they published. Uh, Population projections, I believe, for the year 2025. Yeah, I think I might have heard something about that. And they predicted that the populations of the populations of a lot of these modern countries would be would be greatly reduced. Yeah, I did hear that. I remember the the United States was like really like reduced quite a bit. It was something like 99 million. I don't know where where they came up with this, but I, I think Canada was also a great reduction. There's definitely agendas going on here. I mean, I don't know if you know, but they just like they just kind of like legalized um, euthanasia, like or suicide, basically. Um, and it used to be like if you had a really terminal illness, there's no way out of it, you could opt for that. But now it's like pretty much like wide open. You know, like there's I, I yeah, they, they there was legalized a, assisting suicide, and it, it does kind of bother me because I I know when they push for something, they always push it to the extremes i mean they they cite yeah well, the, the, was you know, there was a, there was a military guy who had ptsd yeah and he called like veterans affairs like to, for some help and that was pretty much the, that was what they suggested they were like well have you thought about suicide <laughs> you know like it's just the two that's and he, really he, bothersome yeah uh, speaking of military <laughs> what, what is the general impression of a uh, of vladimir putin in canada right now Oh, I can't. I can't speak to that either. I. I don't know. My. I don't know. I don't. I mean, know. do you see? Do you see Ukrainian flags out there like you do in America? Oh yeah, you see all that stuff. They're like. You, you, okay. There was definitely the whole. That yeah, for sure, for sure. But are, uh, are they? Are they will? Are they just flying the flags, or would they be willing to get out there and fight? 
Oh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. And I don't even know what to think of it. Like, how do you even get the truth? I don't know what the truth is about you. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, I think I know quite a bit more than the average person. Yeah. But yeah. How yeah. do you know? Like, yeah, that, that's the beauty of who would, media yeah, who would, and propaganda. Is, yeah. Who would be some trustworthy sources on that? You'd have to. Yeah. You'd have to listen to people who are there. One guy, actually, I, I ran into, I really liked this thing was, um, his name is uh, the the Indigo Traveler, and he went like he okay, was right yeah. there. Yeah, that's that, and that's one reason why I, that is what I think one of the positive things about social media is now that I have you know I, I can connect with people and I have and you know every once in a while when something's going on, I can usually find somebody who's out there who's in that place. You know, I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I brought you on this show because you're Canadian and I know you and you're a filmmaker. So, you know, let's instead of just reading, you know, the, and, and, you know, I, I I had another show recently with a, a, a Polish activist. I said, let you know, hey, what's going on in Poland? Tell me, you know, nowadays with social media, you can go and you, you don't have to worry about the news. You can go and find your friends in those areas and maybe they aren't experts necessarily paid experts but they but they know the area and they know something about the area they right. know the history you know and like i thought like, there's a lot of things that this guy covered that contradicted what i thought was true you know yeah. what i mean so i had to reevaluate all that um yeah well, so uh, again how do you really ever know it, it, these days yeah. like yeah. i was watching this thing they were showing uh, they were making it on as it was a ukraine I think Jeff Berwick had it on uh, his uh, Dollar Vigilante the other day. And, but, so they're making it on like all this destruction is in the Ukraine, but really it was Libya. Like, so they had a side by side of the same thing, but it was Libya. It was, yeah. The, yeah I mean, yeah, they, they put out those photos, you know, and I, I know, you know, and, and certainly they do that all the time. Uh, you know, I remember, you know, I remember watching the movie Deer Hunter, you know, from the 1970s, which won an Oscars, you know. Yeah. And it was supposed to take place in and, and part, a lot of it was taking place in Pennsylvania. And they have this one scene. And I just I, I just said I just said seeing that scene, I said, Pennsylvania doesn't have mountains like that. <laughs> you know, and they were showing mountains that had snow caps. And I said, no, Pennsylvania doesn't have mountains with snow caps. You know, and, and sometimes often you you have that situation where, you know, uh, you know, they'll they'll use footage or they'll kind of create footage and try to create a scene and you know the war zone it's a uh, it's really interesting do you, do you you know you mentioned you know the script do you think some of these different news organizations are all reading from a script that comes from some centralized source somewhere say that again sorry do you think they're all reading from one script that comes from some bureaucrat somewhere who's written a script that this is what you're going to say on the news today i mean well, I know that to be true because I, yeah. I used to work for the news. Like, so in the morning, the technicians, yeah. the cameraman, everybody else, like we're on the floor. Yeah. The journalists go upstairs in like this, the glass room yeah. and you have the news managers and stuff that come yeah. in, but I, the talking points are coming from Toronto. Like there has to be a certain yeah. un, unifying thing, right? Like, yeah. Coming from that, what do you think is a way where we can fix where journalism can be fixed or, or can it be fixed? I mean, I think we're always going to have journalism. I mean, I don't think journalism is going to disappear. But Well, the thing is, there are, there's less and less journalists. So let me explain. Like, they're temps. They're temps. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I was a temp. Yeah. Uh, and when I got, to, I got to CTV in Halifax, I worked there for, I don't know, a year or so. And the boys told me, like, once they got the, they like don't get stuck here like this guy bought out in the 90s by a, a, a conglomerate called globe media and nobody gets hired anymore they're just giving packages to the older guys to get rid of them so your journalists are not trying to keep their job they're trying to get a job <laughs> that they're not going to get so they're not going to rock the boat like that's that's the long and short of it so do you think maybe that's part of the problem is, I mean, I, you know, that's the same thing with actors and, and directors and is, is there always, is there always basically thinking about how, you know, not just doing their own job, but how they're going to get the next job. Exactly. Be because it, because it is, a, it, it is a gig economy. It's not really a job economy. 
No, we get and we got paid nothing. Like I was getting like eleven seventy yeah. five an hour, and the, you know, doing yeah. the same job as the guy beside me, getting sixty thousand dollars a year, or seventy year, or whatever. Yeah. Like, of course, this was twenty years ago. There, like twenty five years ago. <sighs> Again, like they're not going to rock the boat. You're not really getting good journalism if the journalist is trying to get a job. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and there is there is a narrative. Like I mean, like th- there's political narratives. Like yeah. And, and everybody catches on to what they're supposed to say, you know. So it's always going to be a go along to get along kind of thing. So, yeah, yeah, I would say. But you know, I haven't worked for every news media, but I worked for yeah. CTV, I worked for Radio Canada, um, I think maybe yeah. CBC at times. Can I worked we, for Fox and ABC too. Like you know, like can we get to a <laughs> point where maybe the go along get along narrative is that freedom is a good thing? I mean, it would obviously wouldn't happen overnight, but it could certainly be changed. Well, then you got people like me who leave the paycheck to do exactly that. Yes. You know? And it's not an easy road. Like, it, it was not an easy road. Like, I, my bank account's gone to zero more times than I can count. And, yes. But I kept, I, I just had to follow yeah. my heart, you know. But I got a lot of cool things that happened too, you know. Like I worked for the Trailer Park Boys. They sent me to Peru to make a film about ayahuasca and shamanic medicines. And oh, yeah, I've been to, you know, like I traveled with Jeff and Luke to that anarchist town. I've been to Ecuador. Sure, right, yeah. I had all yeah. sorts of adventures. The, who who are the Trailer Park Boys? Well, you certainly don't live in Canada if you don't know that. Like the it's. The biggest show I think ever in Canada. It's Bubbles and Julian and Ricky, and it's it's funny. Like it's just a comedy show, right? They did a they did a mockumentary sitcom. Yeah, so yeah. so you did something going down to uh, doing to, down to Peru for ayahuasca. When was that? It was well. It was, I, I worked on season ten, but really, there were, it, because of my cannabis movie, uh, the Rick Simpson movie. They they knew who I was, and they they hired me for season ten as like camera and behind the scenes and all sorts of like it was really fun yeah snoop dog was on that year uh tom arnold uh yeah we have bobby fairley came in as a guest director yeah. are there, are there <laughs> and, uh, but they were kind of scouting me for this trip and with anything so like the 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 next week like i we had yeah. rap on friday and tuesday lee called me he's like hey you want to go to peru and make this film are you like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so you got to go to peru you know <laughs> I remember some time ago there was also a Canadian series called Little Mosque on the Prairie. Yeah, where, I, I didn't watch. Where they had it, where they had a where they had a where the guy in, a, in somewhere in small town Canada needs to have a mosque and he can't find a place, so he actually uh, it, it, apparently the, the church says, "Oh, you can use some of our space for your mosque." So it's so it, so it's like you're in a in a in a you know in a in a, in a Christian in, in some Christian based church. I just thought that was very interesting. But, well, the irony is I haven't watched television, even though I've yeah. worked since 2009. Like when the, the bank crashes, the bailouts yeah. happen, that day I was like, I'm, yeah. I'm done. I'm I, was curious if there was a, I was curious if there was any good Canadian shows that maybe Americans should check out. I know, I know there's Trailer also that. You know, I also know if you've seen that, this is from quite a while ago, but you, do you remember that Rick Mercer show, Talking with Americans? Yeah, yeah Rick Mercer was kind of funny. He goes, he goes and talks. And for example, he, it's so hilarious, but he gets, he gets uh, Americans to say really silly things like congratulations, Canada on legalizing VCRs. And, 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 yeah. and, and you know, he, he, he even, he even got a few, a few politicians. Like he you got George Bush and he asked him how he liked uh, president Putin in Canada or something like that. And, yeah. and, like, and he totally had no idea. He's like, Oh yeah, I think he's a great yeah, guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got a couple governors too, a, a couple of state governors. <clears throat> I mean, he definitely got Mike, like congratulations Canada on your national igloo. I mean, it was so funny. I mean, <laughs> but he, Americans need to watch stuff like that now and then just because they, they, they see how they're perceived and maybe it takes them a little bit out of their comfort zone, but it's, it, it is interesting how Canadians view Americans and you certainly see, uh, you know, we, we've, uh, there's always, you know, it's, a, I mean, it's arguably been one of the longest, uh, longest, 
border longest peaceful border in, in history arguably i mean there hasn't really you know there hasn't been a war fought across these borders since really 1814 and they part of the motivation of the war of 1812 in america was oh go grab canada you know well there was something like that yeah the americans did yeah. attack canada at one point and then the canadians went down and burnt down the white house or something like that and yeah the, the, the canadians and the English, yes they, they they went into washington dc and burned the city it was a yeah uh, and yeah, that's that's all and I remember. The war I was, that. And the war was over, and nothing was changed, and that's ultimately why why Canada and America have been at peace since, ever since. Uh, of course, yeah, Canada like I think they like, then, they wanted yeah. to make it like one country, and that that was the I don't know, I don't know. yeah. I don't believe. I also understand at one point was it wasn't was Newfoundland a separate country, or what was up with that? They were they were separated or a separate colony or something like that. Yeah, again, Newfoundland. Yeah. You want to meet some cool people though? Go to Newfoundland. They're they're. You got the, they got the coolest accent. They're nice, friendly people, and uh, they drink yeah. like fish. <laughs> I, I've not been. I've not been to the Maritimes, but I've heard. I've heard. I've heard. It's all very, very. A lot. It's of very friendly here. Like people very here beautiful are very nature. Friendly. You know, I, I, it's funny, but I think when people live in beautiful places, where where it's just you know where you have beautiful mountains and beautiful rivers and waterfalls, that it, it, I don't know. It's, it probably just tends to make them nicer. Maybe. I, maybe. Maybe I don't maybe, know. Maybe, maybe maybe not, but it's a uh, you know, but certainly worth. But we don't have big cities in New, in Eastern yeah. Canada other than Halifax, right? And even Halifax, not that big. Yeah, but, you know. yeah, you have Halifax. I mean, yeah, no, none of those cities are that big. I know they're. I mean, you know, I might go to. I, I might want to go to Newfoundland to check out some of the Viking sites or something like that. That would be. So it's like small out. communities. Like you got to think yeah. of it that way because it's like big cities. That's like where people go to live to be lonely together, right? Like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean I've been I've been to Toronto, I've been to Montreal, I've so yeah. Uh, well anyway, uh Chris, Chris, it's been good having you on here. Uh, uh so tell us more where, what we should check out from you and what we can expect from you in the future. Is there anything else you want to say before we go? No, just October 29th, uh tiptoepremier.com. Go check it out. And uh, if you buy a ticket, you can be involved in the uh, Q&A as well as seeing the film. And it would yes. really help this filmmaker because I don't have a steady income anymore. It's all donor based now. Like, it's, you know, it's value for value. I make a film yes. and hopefully people pay a little bit to watch it. Yes. And, uh, you know, and, and if that happens, then I can put it out for free so more people can see. Um, yes. The, the well, yeah. And I'll have to get on some other sites. I hope I can get this up by then. I'm Chris Baker. Uh, you can certainly check out my website at chrisbaker.net or, or check out my novel, Escape from the Village. This is the Fountainhead Forum, and we will say goodbye. Thank you for coming on, Chris. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thanks, Chris. Cheers.